as Aileen has already shared during a prayer, or reminded us of, today is Pentecost Sunday. Um, it's a great time to, uh, to remember the wonderful things that God has given, and not least, the wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit. So, our scripture this afternoon is from Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. The words are on the screen there. And I'm, I'm making no apology, I'm missing out all the awkward place names. That should be there. You can go and read it yourself in the original Greek if you wish. But uh, anyway, so we're going to begin from verse verse 1. Uh, Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in in our own native language? We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven and he raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. That in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit on those days and they will prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. And the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon will turn to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. Amen. What an amazing scripture that is. And of course, that last verse is so often quoted by those who are sharing the gospel. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Isn't that an amazing truth? That we don't have to get into a particular place before we can call on God. The moment that anyone calls on Jesus, that calls on the Lord with a repentant heart, God is right there. It's absolutely amazing. Today's theme, if you want a theme, is when heaven comes down. I remember uh, <clears throat> Eleanor and I, well, it was, just, it was just last week, it was Eleanor and I. We, every night we have a prayer time, we sing worship songs with John. We pray for the people that we've met during the day, different things, and we have communion together. Then all of a sudden, we just started singing, Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. And it's one that we haven't sung for, I don't know, forever. You know, it's just funny how how those things just come to mind. But that's exactly what Pentecost is all about. It's about heaven, the glory, the power, the purity, the presence of God himself coming down and visiting us on earth and I honestly when I I was pondering this I thought the disciples the followers of Jesus could not have imagined in their wildest dreams what was going to happen they'd been given instructions by Jesus you know to to wait in the city until they were clothed with power and and so they'd be they they were kind of prepared as it tells us in the previous chapter in, in, the, in Acts chapter 1 that in the 10 days since 
Jesus' ascension, when he told them to wait, they'd been meeting together, constantly praying. Constantly praying. That, for me, means day and night. Night and day. Day and night. In God's presence. And it wasn't just the 11 disciples, or the 11 apostles, or 12 apostles, with Matthias being added. It was, there was 120 believers there. I don't know if you've had the, the experience of being at an all-night prayer meeting. It's good. It's really good. And when we were in Manchester years ago, we had a 24-7 thing, you know, for a full week of prayer, day and night. And uh, folk were sort of signing up saying, I'll be there at 3 o'clock in the morning on Thursday morning or whatever for a couple of hours. And people were sort of signing up. And at first there was, there was so many doubters, you know, thinking, oh, it'll not happen. But it was amazing. It was the, a wonderful, wonderful time when we were praying together and worshipping and just being in God's presence. We were taking a leaf out of the, the Moravians' book. That's, that's what they did. They organised themselves into, into what they called choirs so that during every part of day or night there were a, a group of people who were singing, praising, praying beseeching God for his favour. And that's why the Moravian missions that stretched all across the world were so successful because they were birthed in continual prayer. And guess how long that, that prayer meeting lasted for? 100 years! Day and night, 100 years that their, yeah. their prayer lasted. I remember going over to Nicaragua and we, we were visiting the place out in the back and beyond. And there was a Moravian church there. How did that get here? Because they were being empowered by the Spirit. Anyway, so we know there was 120 followers of Jesus who were in that upper room, the same upper room where Jesus had shared with the, the Last Supper with his disciples. And I wonder who was there. Have you ever thought about it? Who, who these 120 were? Obviously, you've got your disciples. Um, Jesus, if you remember, sent out the 12 and then he sent out 72, but we don't have all their names. And then, of course, there was all the people that, the people that he healed, people that he blessed, and you're know, sort of thinking, well, obviously, Lazarus is going to be there, Martha and Mary are going to be there, the people that we, that we hear about. But, you know, the, for me, the best thing about this scripture is everybody, everybody is filled with the Holy Spirit. Every person who was there, there might have well be young people there, older folks, no matter. Blind Bartimaeus, well, no, they don't call, can't call him blind Bartimaeus anymore. Healed in Jericho. Did he follow Jesus to Jerusalem in the last week of his life? But this upper room was filled with people waiting and they were expectant. Because after Jesus' resurrection, he appeared to his church, he appeared to his people. For 40 days. And it, it, you know, miraculous things, you know, the great catch of fish and all that, you know, the stranger on the shore and all that. We could do Akabilk if you want. But it's, it's just the most wonderful thing to know that yes. during those 40 days, Jesus proved that he was alive. And, and, and his, his, his earthly brothers, his mum would be there. His brothers and his sisters mm. would be there in that upper room because now they knew this wasn't just their good big brother. No. This was the Son of God. Jesus was and is the Son of God. And the greatest mystery is that he'd said to them, it's better for you if I go away because if unless I go the comforter will not come. The spirit will not come. And so they're waiting. They're expecting. It's, it, it's glorious. And finally, when the spirit comes, he comes in such power and in such a way that they, they, they're not ready for it, but they're so gloriously blessed. Yes. And Luke, who wasn't even there at the time, who wrote this gospel, gives us this beautiful account that suddenly there's a sound like a rushing, mighty wind, like a hurricane. And it, believe me, I was out in a hurricane in Nicaragua, and you just batten down the hatches and wait till it, it's over. When the hurricanes come, 
And tongues of fire come. And they separate. And, and it, a tongue of fire rests on every single person in that room. Without exception. And you know, that's a beautiful thing, isn't it? That God is no respecter of persons. We don't have to be academic. We don't have to be rich. We don't have to be clever. We don't have to be one thing or another. We just have to love Jesus. Yes. That's the only prerequisite for receiving the Holy Spirit is to love Jesus. And the Spirit comes in power uniquely, wonderfully. And remember what's written in the scriptures. Isaiah says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor the heart of man conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Now, I always used to think, that's, oh, that's great. In other words, that's what's going to happen in heaven. We can't imagine what heaven's going to be like. Yeah, that's true. Yes. But God actually blesses us by bringing heaven down while we're still alive on earth. So that we might know his blessing. And Pentecost yes. is perhaps the greatest um, experience, you know, of of people for that because up until that time the spirit was only given to specific people for specific tasks that God had had for them whether they were kings, prophets, um, those who worked on the temple, uh, furnishings and all this sort of stuff the spirit was given you know those um, godly men and women who helped to save Israel in times of trouble the spirit was given to them but now the spirit is given to each of them. You know, if, if you look in the Gospels, you'll see that Jesus has three who are always close to him, Peter, James, and John. And they were close to him. And they, they were taken into intimate situations in Jesus' ministry because they needed to be especially empowered and strengthened for the individual ministries that God had for them after Jesus had, had returned to glory. Peter became the head of the church. James was the first of the apostles to be martyred. John, of course, went on to be the longest lived of the disciples and, and was used of God by receiving the, the uh, revelation. And so many, you know, began a, a, a sort of a, 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 a Johannine and community. And when he was exiled in his last days, God gave him the book of Revelation, which is such a challenge and a blessing uh, to us in these yes. days. But anyway, you've got 120 folks and they're sitting there and we're told that the tongues of fire come and it rests on each one. God has no favourites. Isn't that wonderful? And yet, yes. and yet the glory of it is, I remember reading this book by a guy called Brother Lawrence. He was a kind of a Roman Catholic and a mystic, but well, no, he wasn't, he wasn't a mystic, he was a blooming cook. He lived over in France in, in a monastery, and God just revealed himself to him in the most glorious way. He was, a, he was a man whose heart was after following Jesus. He just wanted to love Jesus more and more. And, and, and he said this lovely thing, he said, I feel as if God treats me like his favorite. And, and isn't that lovely? That although God has no favourites, he makes each one of us feel so uniquely loved and special that we just know that God's never going to let go of us. It's, it's a glorious thing. So there we go. This is God's great thing. And, and the, the, this day of Pentecost shows us one thing. And that is whatever we have experienced so far of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, he has so much more. As Jesus himself said when he was teaching about, you know, if you being evil, you fathers being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more, this is in Luke chapter 11, will the heavenly father not give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? And so ask. We need to ask. The disciples the followers of Jesus in this upper room receive the, the, the fire of God. And it's a reminder, isn't it, of the presence of God. 
Yeah. When 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 Moses first met God, when he was he was really he'd run away from Egypt. He, he was accused of murder. He ran away from Egypt, you know, and he's hiding himself in the desert. But the Lord appeared to him in in a burning bush in fire, and sent him on a mission that he really didn't want, but he took it and uh, used them gloriously. And of course. When uh, the Lord uh, appeared to Moses again, I mean, I, I love, I love that story. It's, it's, he's there at Mount Horeb, you know, looking after the sheep, and God saying, "I'm going to send you. You're going to go back to to Egypt. You're going to set my people free. I'm going to go with you." And uh, and he's going right. Give me a sign, God. He says, "The sign is that you'll worship me on this mountain." Amen. With all the people. In other words, he says, "No, God. I wanted a sign. To, you know." I want a sign now to show that I can do it. And you go, no, no, the sign is when you've done it. That'll be the sign. It's great, you know. The sign is you, you will worship me on this mountain. And of course, those, however much, it, but a year or whatever it is later, he's standing there at Mount Horeb. And, and, and the people are there. And he goes up into the presence of God. And the fire yes. of God comes onto the top of that mountain. And once they're led from that place, you know, the fire, the pillar of fire goes before them through, through uh, at, at night. It, you know, it, it's a sign of the presence of God. But now it comes into each one. And the words of Jesus are truly made real for them. He that is with you shall be in you. And so each of these followers of Jesus are filled suddenly, gloriously, with the power, the purity, the presence of God. And it's so personal. You know, the fire has touched them and it emboldens them. And of course we know that the outworking of that is that they, they, they can't keep it in. They're bursting to tell of the glories of God and suddenly they're speaking in other languages. Not just, you see, this, this is not just about words, but this is a demonstration of God's power. And I'm so wonderfully reminded of the, the prayer of, of Habakkuk, which is, is it's a, it's amazing. It's in Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, Lord, we've heard of your fame. We stand in awe of your deeds. Yeah. Renew them in our day and in your anger. Remember mercy. If ever there was a prayer for 2004, it's that. Because every fellowship of true believers stands in awe of God's deeds. We remember what he's done in the past. But our prayers, God, of you, Lord, renew it in our day. Would you, would you do it afresh? Would you, would you show your power? Would, would you show the world who you truly are? Because the world's going nuts. The world is going mad and the name of Jesus is, is, is getting crushed. Show your power, Lord, and in your anger. And God has a right to be angry with the way the world is going. In your anger, remember mercy. Of course, let's not forget that Jesus has the victory. Let's not forget that God's having the final word about our world and where it's going. Even though it seems we're so far away from the Lord, God is moving. Lives are still being changed. Miracles are still happening. And our prayer in this year, in this day, has got to be, God, will you do it again? And would you do it? Would you use me? Would you use us would you cause us to be filled so, so full that it's overflowing and spills out? Because, Lord, sometimes I'm so nervous about sharing your word with people. Would you fill me with such boldness that I can't help? Lord, I remember being challenged by a, a book I read by Bill Johnson, The Supernatural Power of a Transformed Mind. And he, and he was sort of saying, listen, Honestly, God wants to give his church in these last days his power because there's such darkness. There's so many lies. There's so much confusion. And our young people are getting battered at school 
from all the junk that's being foisted on them. You know what I'm talking about. And we need, Lord, would you please, would you transform our minds yes. by the power of your Holy Spirit so that we expect you to do great things among us, to expect miracles and wonders. You know, I mean, I, honestly, my, my kids are so much bolder than I am. You know, my, my daughter was sort of driving along the other day. She saw a guy at the bus stop. She felt the Lord saying, just talk to him. Just tell him about Jesus. She goes, no. She drove on. She got to the roundabout. The Lord kept at her. She turned around, stopped the car and said, God just wants you to know that he loves you. And, uh, you know, we've got a church here in Denny, but God just wants you to know that he loves you and, and that you're precious to him. Would, would it be okay if I pray with you? And he's standing at the bus stop. Fortunately, the bus didn't come. She prayed with him and drove off. Four weeks later, he turns up at church. And he's coming, and he's still going. And you think, that's God. I, I might have told you before about my grandkids. I, they're, they're, they're amazing. They were on holiday. Uh, we're, we're in Spain, I think they were booked for a fortnight. And after a week... Six days, they bump into this family that are actually in the room next door. And the kids are the same age, so they're having a great time. But unfortunately, this family's going away tomorrow. So um, one of the lads, Dion, he's, he's got a convergent squint, really serious eye defect. And, he's, and he had an operation a year or so earlier. And um, it wasn't successful. So his eyes are literally in at his nose. He's got to wear huge corrective lenses to try and help him to see clearly. And, and, and my grandkids say to their mum, say, Mum, do you think it'd be okay if we pray with Dion? And the, the family or the other family are the Christians, they're Baptists as well. So Caroline says, do you think it'd be all right? So the next morning when the kids are playing, Matthew, the oldest one, and Anna, they, they can, can we pray for Dion? They just... Lift the hand, put the hands on Dion. Lord, would you just would you heal him in Jesus' name? And then the, the family have to go away. They go away, they go away back home. And the, my grandkids are there for another week to get back home. And there's an email waiting. And there's a picture of Dion and his perfect vision. His eyes are restored. There was no great healer there. There was no big. It was just two kids praying. For another lad. And Jesus did the healing. Now this has got to be ordinary for us. And I get so excited when I hear these things. And I'm going, Lord, I don't understand why you haven't healed John completely yet. But I do thank you for the times when he's at his worst and people pray and he, and he, and he recovers. So there are times when we don't get an immediate answer to prayer. But don't give up. We've got to expect more. I don't know where I am in this stuff. I might as well chuck this paper away. I'm not paying any attention to it. I, I, I think I've probably said just about enough. Well, I just want to... I, I want you to understand or to just catch the fire. The fact that God wants to do more in us, through us, in his church than we can ask Yes. Or imagine in our day for his glory to bring those who are lost into a place where they're found. And I know that it doesn't matter, people are from different backgrounds, and some say, Oh, we're, we're, we don't believe that the gift of the Spirit of day, for today. Don't worry about that. Just say, Let God be God. Because the Holy Spirit, after all, is God Almighty. He's no lesser a part of the Trinity than the Father or the Son. He is God Almighty. The Spirit is God Almighty. So if we say, oh, well, I'm going that bit, I don't agree with that, you think you're actually restricting what God wants to do. And sometimes we need to re-examine ourselves, because let's face it, I'm, I'm terrible. I, I, I always think I'm right. Until my wife proves me wrong. I do. I think I'm right. I mean, I've got a way of doing things. I think it's right. And then she's saying, no, Dave. I'm, I'm slightly getting better at it now. When she suggests something, I'll say, yeah, okay. 
and we'll, and we'll do it without any discussion. And it actually works out smoother that way. But, uh, you know, but it's, as people, we think we're right, and maybe God's got more for us. Maybe God, in his infinite wisdom and in his infinite ways, has got something that might surprise us if we'll just open ourselves up and say, okay, Lord, whatever you want to do in my life, however you want to use me for your glory in the days that remain to me, will you just do it? Wouldn't it be terrible if we get to glory? And the Lord said, well done, good and faithful servant, but actually, I had a wee bit more for you. But you are a bit timid. Let's be open. Amen. Amen. Lord, I pray that you would bring heaven down to us. I'm not going to... I'm going to sing a a song to you. It's one that I wrote back in 1993. But it's kind of appropriate for today. 1993, my goodness. I haven't, no, I haven't put the, um, I haven't put the words up for you. Sorry, you'll just have to listen. It's uh, this is called. Um, I don't know what it's called. It's called Maranatha, oh Maranatha, which it's like, come Lord Jesus, it's like that. You know? oh. Oh, hang on a oh. I know the name of it. It's sheep and distorted. The shepherd. Yeah, John knows it. He's heard it a few times. Even the stork in the heavens knows her time And the eagles in their nest on the mountains high Look to the trees, the leaves are budding green And you know what that means The summer is near Oh, you'd better learn to read the signs I think we're living in the end times I think we're living in the end times Singing, oh Maranatha Lord Jesus, quickly come Come and take possession of your own Quickly come, come and take possession of your bride and take us home. And even in the church, the sheep are led astray, and as their love grows cold, we see some fall away. And even here, the wolves have made their home. They deceive the flock with a lying tongue. Oh, you'd better learn to read the signs. I think we're living in the end times. I think we're living in the end times. Singing, oh, Maranatha, Lord Jesus, quickly come. Come and take possession of your own. of your bride and take us home Lord in your mercy you extend the days so that more may come and receive your grace in an unjust world we hear the children cry Oh, why do the godless flourish and the righteous die? Oh, you better learn to read the signs. I think we're living in the end times. I think we're living in the end times. Singing, oh, Maranatha, Lord Jesus, quickly come. Come and take possession of your own. Oh, Maranatha. Jesus, quickly come, come and take possession of your bride and take us home.
revivers, Jesus, take the central place And may your glory, Lord, be on every face The Spirit is overflowing like a mighty stream Quenching a thirsty world and washing us clean Oh, you better learn to read the signs These are such exciting signs we're living in the end time Singing, oh Maranatha Lord Jesus, quickly come Come and take possession of your own Oh Maranatha Lord Jesus, quickly come Come and take possession of your bride And take us Oh Maranatha Lord Jesus, quickly come Come, come and take possession of your bride and take us home. Lord, take us home. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the one who wants to take us home. God, would you do more in us? Would you do more in our world? then we can ask or imagine, would you bring heaven down once more for yes. us as we near that time when Jesus is going to burst through the clouds and be revealed in all his glory. Lord, please, for your, for your kingdom's sake. Amen. Amen. Have we got time to sing Love Divine or Love's Excelling? Or do you want to go, just go to the last? No. All right. Love Divine or Love's Excelling Joy Oh, oh, oh.
Change.